Welcome, everybody. I am so excited and thrilled to see all of you here. Thank you for taking time uh, out of your, your taking precious time out of your very busy schedules to come and be with us as we unveil our anti-racism and inclusion action plan. Um, I am here with Dr. the Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington. We'll do introductions in a moment, uh, but I want you to know the two of us are going to be leading today's event. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a video uh, to ground us in uh, the work that we're doing and what we're going to be talking about today. So we'd like to start with this video and Scott, if you can take it away, uh, let's, let's share that beautiful video. The West Valley College Black Student Union in collaboration with the West Valley Emoja community and West Valley College is committed to creating a vibrant environment and thriving experience for our Black students. In order to do this, we pledge to advocate and speak up for our Black and Brown students in the classroom as well as on and off campus. We will create awareness of systemic racism and injustices that plague our community and oppress people of color. Additionally, we are committed to creating a voice for our Black and Brown students while emphasizing their value to our campus community. We hear your cries, recognize your pain, empathize with your experience, and value your existence. We are proud to serve you, ready to advocate for you, and excited to grow with you. We ask you to stand with us in speaking out against racism and taking action against injustices. We ask you to collaborate with us in creating an environment of diversity and inclusion while protecting our Black community. We ask you to join us in recognizing that all lives cannot matter until Black lives matter. Well, isn't that a beautiful uh, the grounding for us uh, about the reason for our work and the importance of our work. The students that spoke, uh, the faculty and staff and administrators who spoke, uh, we have to keep grounded in that energy that we just experienced. It's absolutely, absolutely precious and beautiful. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you to Phil and Deborah for creating that. I see Phil here. I see Deborah here, thank you for that uh, and, and for all the work that you do to support students uh, and for the Emoja program and the B, supporting the BSU, Paulette and Phil, uh, my deep thanks for, for all of that work. We are going to now go into, I'm going to screen share here. We're going to go into, um, hold on one second. Um, and we're gonna start our presentation here. Thank you for your patience. Um, so today, as you may know, is the presentation of our anti-racism and inclusion action plan for West Valley College. It is a very important for day, a, a day for us as we publicly and formally commit to work to undo racism on our campus and for our students, faculty, staff, and administrators. Um, I would like to take a moment um, for a land acknowledgement, uh, just as Dr. Jamie uh, expressed his land acknowledgement for the Piscataway. I want to acknowledge that West Valley College has been sitting on the land of the Ohlone and the Muwekma people since its establishment in 1963. For thousands of years, the natives that occupied this very land used this beautiful location of Santa Clara as their home. We recognize that natives were forced out of their homes and colonized through, mis through the missions Dolores, uh, Santa Clara, and San Jose. Let us give an enormous debt of gratitude to the Ohlone and Muwekma tribe because we have benefited from the colonization of their land. As educators, we must educate on the injustices that took place in the past and that continue today. By offering this land acknowledgement, we remember that the Ohlone and Muwekma people are still connected to this region and we affirm indigenous sovereignty. We are Muwekma Ohlone, welcome to our land where we are born. Beautiful. 
So uh, our agenda for today is we're going to do some introductions, talk about the purpose of today's unveiling, talk about some definitions, why the work is important, the structure of the plan, and then we are going to review the actual plan goals. So um, uh, we all know why this work is important. Uh, James Baldwin is certainly someone who um, is one of our scholars and teachers. I consider him one of my teachers uh, on the importance of this work and um, why the inequities persist. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to our, uh, we're calling him our trainer in residence, our coach in residence, the Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington. He's the president and founder of the Social Justice Training Institute. He has a doctorate in student development from the University of Maryland. He has decades of experience in higher education and diversity. Uh, and he's also has a master's of divinity from the Howard School uh, of Divinity. And uh, he's been a friend uh, to the college and a mentor to me. And I would like to welcome Dr. Jamie Washington. Please give him a nice welcome and round of applause. Welcome, Dr. Jamie. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to work with uh, an institution that is committed to moving beyond lip service um, uh, into action to create systemic and structural um, and longstanding change. So thank you for this opportunity. Yes, we're very, very grateful to have you here with us. And you also show up in such a great fashion with your fashion. Your fashion is just <laughs> outstanding all the time. Every time I see you, you are knocking it out of the park with your Thank you. beautiful fashion. <laughs> also, I look, I know who I'm hanging out with, so I have to keep going. <laughs> So, um, you know, with Dr. the Reverend Dr. Jamie, and by the way, the only rev other Reverend Doctor I know is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. So you're in very mm -hmm. good company, sir. Very good company. Yeah. Um, so the purpose of today is we really want to unveil our action plan. Um, we also want to give context to why we're doing this work. And we want to do this in fellowship with all of you. Um, we, we, you know, you, we can see you, you can see us, and uh, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions a little later on, but we wanted to do this uh, in a social, con socially connected um, setting uh, because that's how we operate here. And that's part of the way that we're going to solve these problems is, is, is in community with each other. Um, so I wanna get to some definitions here and do Dr. Dr. Washington, if you can help me out here, sure, the difference sure. between structural and individual racism. And I've included some language here, but if you want to speak at all about sure. uh, your perspective on the difference between structural I, and individual I, racism. I will um, introduce these, these frameworks. And um, I know that many of us have heard um, maybe and, and think about, but one of the dilemmas and one of the reasons that we're in this contextual moment in this conversation is because for the most part, most of us um, in the US have engaged and experienced and talk about racism at the individual level, at the individual experience of race. And, and so we think, uh, we have th think, thought that, um, that so I can be racist to you, you can be racist to me. Um, I, uh, it's my negative treatment of you because of race, your negative treatment of me because of race. And if I don't do that, then I'm not racist. If I don't do that, um, I can't do anything that's racist. So that's an individual level perspective. And at one level, um, most of us would show up in the world, most of us who have joined this conversation today would not be racist, right? We, we're not actually racist, right? Um, uh, uh, now we, we, we think about that as, you know, kind of hateful people. Um, white supremacists, um, uh, the, those uh, kinds of um, uh, act, KKK, those who burn crosses, those folks are racist. And because at the individual level, if I don't participate in that kind of thinking or activity, I can't be. The problem with that limited information or limited definition is that it then does not allow us to hold that racism um, is baked into our system. It's baked into our structure. It's baked into the way we live and breathe 
particularly in the context of the US. So structural racism is about the cumulative and compounding effects of an array of ancestor, um, of societal dynamics around uh, that create, a, that's based on a history as you can see there of exclusion of folks based upon race. The policies, practices, um, procedures, cultural norms that benefits, um, and I like to say it, that has some folks move through more smoothly than others, right? And that as an individual, you might not feel like you are moving through more smoothly, but you are a member of the group that the structure has been set up to help move through more smoothly. Does that make sense? So it's like, no, 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 I don't, I'm, I'm struggling. I got this going on and I got that going on. And that can absolutely be true. But if you look through the lens of race, the structure of systemic exclusion through the lens of race benefits those who identify white differently than it does uh, BIPOC, black, indigenous and people of color, right? Um, and as we move into this experience today, understanding why we have to actively move beyond individual and interpersonal, which has been the work that we've done for many years, understand each other, love each other, be kind to each other, be around more, right? Those things um, have helped us to have some different kind of interpersonal relationships, but they have not removed the structures and the systems. And that's what we're about addressing in this plan. Thank you, Dr. Washington. Beautifully, beautifully said. Um, a, a couple of other, a few other definitions that we need to talk about are the difference between intentional racism and unintentional racism. Uh, I should have also put up here the diff difference between intent and impact, mm -hmm. because that's, that's a big one. Trouble. And the difference between implicit and explicit, right? I I implicit being, um, uh, perhaps not so uh, uh, being more covert. Um, so Jamie, uh, Dr. Washington, can you help us with some of these definitions? Sure, happy to. So again, it's uh, it, one of my uh, favorite um, uh, moments of understanding how I can get to implicit um, and unintentional um, is often unconscious. Like I didn't, like I'm not consciously aware of that. I didn't consciously uh, or intentionally do that. Um, and uh, intentional and explicit um, are things that are clearer and I intended to do that. Now, while I may have intended to do something, I still might not have known why I did it. So I actually intended to use that word or to say that thing but I didn't necessarily understand the impact or the racialized implication of that. So sometimes folks will say, well, yes, you did. You intended to say that, right? And I did intend to say that, but I didn't know that that had race overtones or undertones or implications uh, because um, it's a part of that structural stuff that I took in and didn't realize was, was in fact the case. And so, um, as we begin to think about implicit, those are often um, those things that are that are baked into us that we don't we don't recognize. Here's one of my uh, favorite examples. I'll give you a quick example. I was doing a, uh, a a training one time. A campus was committed to increasing diversity and inclusion. Very committed to that um, uh, through the lens of race. So diversity uh, by race um, and. Uh, Dean of this college was saying uh, he understood and really very much supported um, diversifying the campus community, having more people of color, very much supported that. And he had just done a search for an associate dean. In that search process for the associate dean, when it got up to the um, hiring authorities, the final say, they sent it back to him and said, the candidate pool, the, um, the final recommendations did not have enough diversity. Um, and who was recommended was ended up being a white person, white man. Um, and so they wanted him to go back and try again. He said, Jamie, the part I struggle with was I understand this and I support this, but all the black jobs had already been filled.
implicit, unconscious, is that somewhere in his mind for some reason, he had, these are the black jobs. These are the jobs for black and brown people. And we are actively filling those. All of the rest of these jobs are for white people. And so he didn't consciously, he didn't say, he didn't say all the, um, the, the these jobs is white people's jobs. He didn't say that. But the implicit unconscious bias around all the black jobs were already filled was that there's only so many jobs that we have here that are for black folks or for brown folks. Does that make sense to y'all? Right. So it's the implicit. But and this was and he wasn't being this wasn't a nasty person. He wasn't trying to you know be racist. But that's how it showed up. And as we were able to walk through that and move through that, then he was able to wrestle with what was there that he didn't actually realize. That's terrific. Thank you, uh, Dr. Washington. That, that is a great example. And it often shows up, this implicit yes. bias in the hiring process. That's I can right. tell exactly. you that I think one of the things that I observe in myself and in others is when we talk about, during the hiring process about, I think this person would be a good fit. Mm. Oftentimes the conversation about good fit is really a revealing of our implicit bias. Mm -hmm. It's who we're comfortable with. And if we're hiring someone that I don't regularly see in my personal life, I don't sit, they don't sit at my dinner table, they don't, uh, they aren't a member of my friend group, then level of comfort is going to be low. And I'm not aware of that. And it shows up as me saying, I don't think they'd be a good fit. That that is documented. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you oh, know, yes. I've done research on this, but that's how implicit bias shows up. It's unintentional and it's implicit, but it's showing up, and the the harm is equal to the intentional and explicit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Washington. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to our next uh, talking about why it's important to do the work. Let's start off with the question of why do we need to do anti-racism work? Right. And um, so we may want to talk about Ibram Kendi and his definition about anti-racism, that the opposite of a racist is not not racist. Mm -hmm. It's anti-racist, which is an action and an active persona yes. if you are an anti-racist. So Jamie, what are your thoughts on why we need to yeah. do this work? I want to go into this uh, 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 briefly, Stephanie, because I think it is important that as so, folks, back in February, all of us got hit with COVID-19, right? This health pandemic. And so we are about, we're out here. We've got to figure out how to do all kinds of things. We got to get online. We got to get people home. We got workers. We got, we got students. We got all this stuff. And so pandemic, health pandemic number one um, shows up. Um, and then, uh, and so we're moving through. And I knew um, at health pandemic number one, while it was very clear that at the beginning of COVID-19, it was racialized as Chinese and Asian disease, right? So it had a racialized focus um, that was there at the beginning, but then it went, it just kind of, you know, kind of settled in um, and we just kept on moving, right? And, uh, but the, the impact, the differential impact on minoritized communities was not felt initially. We were just in reaction mode, right? To get, get to space. I knew that the differential impact on minoritized communities was coming, but I spent my first three months of COVID-19, in addition to watch, binge watching television, staying up late at night and eating good food. Um, in addition to doing that, I spent my first three months figuring out how to transfer the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion to a virtual environment. That was where I was. And then May 25th occurred and the murder of George Floyd and in the murder of George Floyd, pandemic number two, the one who's been, that's been around for more than 400 years of systemic racism, shown its ugly head. Now, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and others had already also been um, harmed um, by this systemic racism. But there was a tipping point, 
right, that happened. And the collision of those two pandemics brought us to this moment of racism, enough is enough. And so why now, why anti-racism? I just want to invite that we are not saying in this work that we are making hierarchies of pain or oppression. We're not saying that race is all that matters. We're not saying that sexism is gone or heterosexism is gone or classism is gone. We're not saying any of that. We're not saying, uh, um, as was said beautifully in um, the video by the students, we're not saying that all of us don't matter. But if we are not willing to do the work, particularly in the context of the US, that acknowledges how race matters and particularly how the race dynamic in this country has been set up in a binary of black and whiteness and anti-blackness as a thing, then we do not move the needle, right? And so everyone that I'm working with now have, has shifted from diversity, equity, and inclusion to anti-racism work, right? Um, because there's a recognition at this moment of the need to do the deep dive into race. I've been saying to folks, I've been at this for 30 some odd years and diversity, equity and inclusion has been a smoke screen for some and a way out of doing race work. Folks are comfortable and more willing to engage other topics. And this moment is saying, you cannot do that anymore. And so that's where we are. That's why we're in the anti-racism work and that we must engage this by looking at the dynamics of anti-blackness, particularly in the context of the US. Thank you, Jamie, so beautifully stated. And, uh, and I think you know all of us, whether we realize it or not, have been racialized. Yep. Uh, some of us are more aware of it because for example, for me, I became aware of my race very early because um, I was so different from every community that I lived in. When I lived in South Korea, I was different from my South Korean friends. And when I moved to the US, I was different from my white American friends. And so, and they let me know that sometimes in kind ways and sometimes in cruel ways. And so you, be, you become aware very early for most people of color uh, of your racial identity because it's imposed on you externally. We don't create our racial identities, they are imposed on us. And we only take ownership of them after they've been imposed on us. So the question that sometimes comes up, why is everything, does everything have to be a, about race? I certainly never wanted it to be about race, but it's been imposed on me and every person of color. So my question is, yes, why is it always about race? My question is back to you. Yes, why is it always about race? I didn't create this identity, um, you know, uh, other people did. So uh, I think, yeah, and it's beautifully stated about why we need to address it. I agree that the, the masking of the race work uh, in, in, the, in diversity work, so I'm very glad we're dealing with this now. And why anti-Black racism? I'm gonna share my perspective on this. I think uh, Jamie uh, beautifully stated why it's important, uh, you know, certainly because of George Floyd on May 25th, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, these outrageous incidents of people who are just going about their lives and being murdered because of implicit bias or sometimes explicit bias, being chased down while you're jogging and shot to death is, is certainly is not implicit. That's pretty explicit. Uh, as Ahmaud, Ahmaud Arbery was. Um, and so why anti-Black racism? Uh, those of you who read the New York Times, I would really highly recommend you take a look at the 1619 Project. Mm -hmm. Slavery is one of the original sins of this country. This country yep. was founded on an ethos of a hierarchy of races. So when African descended peoples, when Africans were brought here on ships, uh, to build this country, to build the economic wealth of white owners, to build institutions of higher learning, to build the White House, uh, to build really all of the things that we benefit from now. And they were enslaved, so they certainly weren't compensated for it. When they were brought here, it was um, a perspective that the owners of these slaves realized that they had to um, create a, 
a narrative that ensured that uh, no black person would ever be considered equal to a white person. And so thus, you know, we, we know about the, um, the three fifths uh, equation and so forth. And that perspective became so embedded uh, in all thought for every institution, um, that black white binary as Dr. Jamie says that um, it, it remains with us today there is a racial hierarchy. It was created 400 years ago and it remains today. Um, and uh, black and indigenous people are at the bottom of that hierarchy. Um, I'm not saying that it's my personal opinion. I certainly don't share that. I'm telling you that is the hierarchy that we know exists. Um, and so because it's the original sin and I think the other original sin of this country is the genocide of indigenous peoples. Um, uh, we talked about uh, the Ohlone earlier um, and so we have these, uh, these original sins that we have to deal with. And it's critical that I think we get to the anti-Black racism uh, as a starting point, because I think it was the starting point for, uh, uh, for the levels of bias and the narrative around bias and racializing people and um, the damage that's done to people of color, I think the, the origin of that comes from, um, uh, you know, our history of slaver slavery. So if we can't get to that, and if we can't create space just to focus on anti-Black racism, we will never adequately address the issue of anti-racism and be truly anti-racist. So we have intentionally in this plan decided to focus on anti-Black racism because of its devastating impact Today, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and in the last 400 years consistently. So um, that is, it's my perspective, it's my commitment as president that we are going to focus on anti-Black racism as the starting point um, because of that and because of the damage that continues to be done uh, uh, today and, and ongoing. So. Uh, I feel very strongly about that, and I don't know, uh, Jamie, if you have any thoughts about that. No, I just want to uh, just want to um, kind of co-sign on what you're naming there, Stephanie, and that we want to make sure that folks are hearing that we are not saying black people or black pain is worse than other people of color pain, right? So we just want to make sure that is heard. Um, and that as Stephanie named the starting point, um, because this anti-blackness dynamic is an experience that permeates our system across all racialized groups, including within black folk, right? Um, and so it's the dynamic of anti-blackness that we're talking about as a part of as an outcome of systemic racism, not black people per se, right? Um, and yes, it differentially impacts black people, but it's the dynamic of anti-blackness that we're hoping that we will be able to hold as a, as, as a starting place and that we not hear that as making um, the experience of other minoritized folks by race less significant or important, because that's not the message. Thank you, that's beautifully stated. Uh, certainly is not the message and, and we, our goal is to address all types of bias uh, as we move forward. We're starting with anti-black racism focus, uh, but you know we are going to continue to do this work sure. for years to come. And in terms of what your role is, we would like everybody to be involved in this work um, uh, because we think it's that important. So we're gonna move now to talking about the report, uh, our actual anti-racism and inclusion action plan report. We start with a definition of anti-racism. We then have five overarching goals and we also have some sub goals and work leads. So we are now going to go, I'm going to stop share and then I'm gonna switch over to the plan so give me a moment here. Are there any questions while I'm doing this? Um, any? Really appreciating all of the comments in the chat. It's great ways for us to engage as well. Um, uh, so yes. All right. So we a, are, go ahead. Uh, yes. 
I've been, so, I've been so proud of the work that West Valley College is doing. I've been I've been sharing what I know about it um, up to now, uh, such as the uh, the anti blackness commitment document that came out of the academic senate and and I just wonder how what your feelings are about about sharing and telling other districts around the state what's what you're doing here today because I think it's pretty groundbreaking. Yeah, thank you for that, Trustee Gray. We uh, it's interesting. I want to share with you that I heard that and May uh, I'm going to call you out in a really positive way, as always. That May was in a breakout group recently with Laura Hope from the State Chancellor's Office and was talking about our plan and that Laura Hope asked for a copy of it. We are more than happy to share our plan. We would love to do this. This, this. we don't, we don't take, uh, you know, uh, we don't consider it to be uh, exclusive to our campus. We want to share um, the wisdom that is contained within this this plan. And this plan has really been created as a collaborative effort, uh, led by Deborah, but including the commission, our uh, diversity commission, um, and um, you know, a lot of folks contributing to it. So yes, we would be more than happy to share. And actually uh, we sent out a press release for today's event. So uh, I don't know if there's anyone uh, joining us from any of the um, media sources, but uh, we're happy to share a recording of this and the plan. And we've actually posted the plan centrally so that anybody in this chat or, or at the college can get access to it. I think uh, Rebecca, it, you placed the link in the chat, did you not? I did, but I'll do it again. Okay, great. So you can access all of you can access this and read it on your own. It is um, uh, it's something. It's twenty three pages. We're we're not going to read the whole plan to you. So you may want to go through it individually. We're going to give you an overview here, and we have about twenty five minutes left. So let's get started on this. We have a beautiful cover here with some of our students, Jaya and Alexis and Caleb. I see there, uh, wonderful, wonderful graphics. Um, there's a message from me that's basically saying what I've said earlier this hour, which is the, our commitment to this work, why we need to do the work and why we are focusing on anti-Black racism and the fact that this is really an initial and first step. And we know that our actually our largest population of minoritized students at the campus is Latinx students. And we absolutely have a commitment moving forward to address uh, anti uh, Latinx bias, anti-immigrant bias, which is so present today, as we know, especially in our political sphere. So as Jamie has said, please do not see this plan as in any way ex an attempt to uh, ignore the pain that is being experienced by other groups. It is a starting point and we definitely are going to get to uh, the experiences and addressing the pain and experiences of other groups. So uh, we have five overarching goals here. And um, what I'd like to do is to call on some folks to read these for us. Mm -hmm. So I am going to start with, I'm looking through to see who's here and maybe I will start with uh, Phil. I did see you here, Phil, would you be willing to read goal A? Absolutely. Sorry, I'm moving around. And can up. you see it? I'm sorry, I'm catching people off guard. This is like a class where you didn't think you were going to be called on and suddenly <laughs> it falls on you and you're wondering, okay, what do I do not know? But Phil, thank you. If you could read goal A and then I'll ask Ana Lobato to read goal B. So go ahead, Phil. Absolutely. Goal A, unearthing, examining, acknowledging and identifying concrete actions to account for the racial history of West Valley College. Thank you. So uh, unearthing, isn't that a beautiful term? Unearthing uh, and acknowledging and identifying concrete actions to account for the racial history. Every institution has a racial history. Every institution, every person, every institution has a racial history. So this is about doing a deep dive into our racial history. Uh, let's go to goal B, Ana Lobato. Could you kindly read that one? Yes, of course address anti-blackness in the campus culture. Thank you. So as Jamie has shared with us, anti-blackness is infused into our structures and into our culture as Americans. Um, and even though individually, we may not feel like we have any anti-black feelings or thoughts, uh, it is infused into our culture. So we need to address it uh, very intentionally. 
Uh, goal C, let's see, I'm going to ask um, Yalem, would you be willing to read goal C? Okay. Uh, implement sustainable actions to contribute to an anti-racist culture at West Valley College. Beautiful. So this is the action part, right? We need to ensure that we're engaging in action and not just conversation. Conversation is great. We love it. I love this conversation, uh, but we need to be taking specific actions because we know who we have inequitable outcomes for our students. I'm going to ask Shamiran to read goal D. Shamiran? Yes. Create a cultural competency training for staff, students, faculty, and administrators. Beautiful. So uh, we're trying to create uh, increased capacity, knowledge, um, skills, um, for us to be able to implement uh, this cultural shift to address uh, anti-racism. So that requires training. And so we are committed to providing that training. I am going to ask Andy Kinden to read goal E. <laughs> Got to unmute myself. Goal E, creating a welcoming, supportive, and inclusive campus climate. Thank you. All of us in this room know how important it is to be inclusive and welcoming. And there are ways in which we unintentionally, remember we talked about intention and, and unintentional and intentional. There are ways in which sometimes we unintentionally uh, give negative messages to students. And so we need to examine that, ensure that we're undoing that and creating the most welcoming and supportive uh, campus climate. So move, those are our overarching five goals. They're fantastic and they're ambitious and I'm 100% confident that we can achieve them uh, through collective work uh, and collaborative work and in fellowship with each other. So I'm very excited about these very ambitious goals. Um, we have an evaluation process for this plan. And the evaluation process is that there will be two groups that uh, do an evaluation of progress on the plan and the goals twice a year. The first uh, group is a new council and it's the Black and African American Student Staff and Faculty Council. They will review this uh, re uh, progress reports on, on these actions twice a year and they will uh, give an assessment. And the other group is the Commission for Equity and Inclusion, which used to be called the President's Commission for on Diversity. It's still the same group, we just renamed it. And twice a year, they are going to evaluate. They will use this evaluation key. Those of you who are teachers, you all know all about rubrics. We've got excellent, satisfactory, developing, and needs improvement. And they're going to be very honest. If we need improvement in an area and we're not seeing progress, uh, we're going to address that. And um, it's my responsibility then to ensure that we shift into higher gear on that particular area. So we've labeled all each of the goals in development right now. So they're all in the purple status because we have started on some of these, but certainly not finished. Here's a beautiful picture of I believe it's the Emoja group uh, and Phil is there with his students. I see some familiar faces there, uh, Jaya and Caleb again. And um, so wonderful, wonderful faces, Alexis. And we have uh, the definition, the Ibram Kendi definition of anti-racism. Um, Jamie, did you wanna say anything about this definition? It's such a driving force in the work we're all doing nationally now on anti-racism. Well, um, yeah, and what uh, I like to remind folks of as we talk about this is Dr. Kendi's work is not new, right? Um, and what Dr. Kendi is offering us is um, the the notion that um, also Dr. Robin D'Angelo talks about being nice is not enough, Yeah. right? And so um, no such thing uh, there is a such thing as being, um, uh, you, you can call yourself non-racist, but that is not anti-racist. And a non-racist helps to maintain the status quo, right? So yeah. what Dr. Kendi is naming here in his definition is that if you are intending to eradicate racism, 
then you have to be an anti-racist. So you have to actively do things. All it takes to maintain racism is for good people just to remain nice. Yeah. All right, just remain nice um, and, and um, talk about the system, but not address the system, All right? Um, gosh, it's, it's just so horrible. This, this systematic is just awful, this racism, and uh, that shouldn't have to happen. Um, and so critiquing, and we do this well in higher education. We got lots of capacity and energy to critique. Right. Um, and so we can name the problem, but not engage our responsibility in helping to shift it. All right. So what Dr. Kennedy is saying, anti-racism is really being willing to look at not just how I individually treat you at the interpersonal level, but also to look at the systems, the, the procedures, the policies, the practices, the cultural norms that um, uh, have been created to support the smooth movement of folks who identify as white differently than BIPOC and other people of color. Uh, and so that, that is of particular importance as we think about this. Um, and what I appreciate about what you're sharing here is this commitment to ongoing assessment and evaluation. Right. So um, some of the earlier work around trying to address racism was we've got to increase the demographics, right? Like, you know, we haven't, we, ha we haven't had access, right? Minoritized folks haven't had access. Okay, so now they got access. That did not take away racism, right? So that's not where the problem was. It was one of the symptoms, it was one of the pieces, right? And so we've, we, 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 and it's not gone. We continue to address the demographic dynamic in need. And so what we see now is that, yes, people are here. What else is in the system that's creating the inequity, right? Um, uh, in, the prob uh, uh, in, in, the, in the outcomes, right? And so that's what the continued work has to be about. Thank you, Jamie. Yes, beautiful framing, beautiful framing. Uh, we next list our guiding principles these are amazing guiding principles that were created by our Equity and Inclusion uh, Commission. I'm not gonna go through them. We don't have time. Uh, we have gone through them in this forum before, but these are also posted, uh, I believe in the same place, aren't they, uh, Rebecca? And you can go through them. They're really, really impressive, ambitious, um, uh, deeply thought through and considered uh, and very courageous. I have to say, I think there's, enormously courageous uh, guiding principles that have been adopted by the Academic Senate, which I most appreciate, the Classified Senate, which I most appreciate, College Council. So these are formally now the West Valley College guiding principles. Uh, they're, they're our anti-racist guiding principles, which, which we Very hope powerful. to infuse through all of our work. So I encourage you to go through and take a look at those uh, guiding principles because you will be asked to align with them in your work here at the college. And students, you can see what the impact, uh, you can see uh, what we're committing to and how that shows up for you in your experience in, in, inside and outside of class. And you can give us feedback on how we're doing too. So the next portion, and I know we are limited in time, we have about 12 minutes left, so I want to wrap up, but the next portion, I encourage you to go and to read through it in detail, is really taking each goal and then uh, disaggregating it or, or, or breaking it out into sub-goals. So for example, with goal A about unearthing our racial history, we have sub-goals of examining the racial history, disaggregating data, and lif lifting Black and African American voices. Um, those, are an exa those are examples of three sub goals. And um, we have much more detail on what that looks like. And we have uh, uh, listings of work working group leads. So for each of these sub goals, we're going to have a working group with a lead. We are asking now for people who are interested. I know the Classified Senate sent out a message. The Academic Senate sent out a message about those who are interested in working on these subgroups. And these are going to be work groups, folks. These are not going to be get together and chat. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here. So the working group to examine racial history, 
you're going to be doing research. You're going to be looking at um, uh, the way we name our buildings, looking at our data, um, and you're going to be sharing uh, that information publicly through our biannual uh, progress updates uh, and looking for ways to demonstrate commitment to equity through art and memorials and events and so forth. So that's an example how each of these goals is broken down into a sub goal and then a working group to work on this. And if you read through it, you will understand how very ambitious this and courageous this plan is and how necessary how necessary, it, it's, it's really work that is long overdue and um, that, that, we, that we need to confront and, and, um, and take on. So uh, the remainder of the report is the breakdown of each overarching goal into sub goals. And I encourage you to look at it. I don't think we have time now to go through each one. What I'd like to do is in our last uh, 10 minutes is to open it up. I'm gonna stop sharing here. Actually, you know what? I do wanna go through and show you uh, 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 one important aspect before we stop sharing here. I do wanna show the acknowledgements. We have some uh, racial statistics here that uh, our students are 60% uh, non-white, um, but our staff, faculty and administration is 40% uh, non-white. So we have a discrepancy in the representation of our student population in our faculty, staff, and administration. And representation is another important aspect of honoring the experience of students, is to hire people who reflect their experience and understand their experience. So we have some work to do in diversifying our, uh, diversifying our, our uh, employees. And, I do hiring want them and hiring them at all levels. Yes, and hiring them at all levels, exactly. Because we right now our staff is, is uh, a fairly equal match to our student demographics, but faculty uh, and administration not so. Um, so we have to be very intentional about that. I want to acknowledge, uh, I want to be sure to, I, that I acknowledge before we leave uh, Chancellor Davis, he has really laid the groundwork for all that we are doing by creating uh, the Dean position for uh, uh, equity and uh, student equity and success for identifying and creating the plan for our center for identity exploration and inclusion. Um, he really has laid the groundwork and been a visionary leader in terms of the direction we need to move. And none of this work that I am doing that the college is doing would be possible without his laying that amazing foundation. I also want to call out Miss Nash, Carolyn Nash, um, was the faculty member who initiated, started, founded, and maintained and sustained uh, the Emoja program before it was Emoja, it was called Success. Uh, and she was the mentor to hundreds of black students at this college, and probably the, the in some ways, the only really safe space for many of them to have, uh, to, to share their experiences here. So I want to honor Ms. Nash. I want to honor the Black and African American Affinity Group, that has been uh, an indispensable advisor to me and for voicing their experiences and for advocating for this kind of plan um, and this kind of work. I want to honor our current and former Black and African American students without whom uh, we would not have uh, the, the motivation to do this work and for whom we have the motivation to do this work. Um, I want to acknowledge her Lisa Hamp who was our inaugural Dean of Student Equity and Success and our former Director of Student Equity, who really, um, uh, she was the first one to bring to our attention the importance of this work and to um, start educating us on uh, the ways in which we needed to improve and before her untimely death. And so we really honor her, Lisa, and the work that she has done. And also I want to honor Deborah Griffith for her visionary leadership. Um, she, without her, none of this would be happening. So uh, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing this now and we're going to take questions um, in the last few minutes. I also want to acknowledge Phil and Paulette uh, for their ongoing uh, enormous work uh, in leading our Emoja program and supporting our Black Student Union. Uh, so thank you for that. We have many, many leaders uh, uh, who've been doing great work. So any questions? We only have a few minutes left. Yes, I see Jed Koo. Jed, Jed, what is your question? Well, um, 
I was saying that um, speaking of racism and justice among the African American community, as well as pretty much among all the everyone living in the United States um, right now, especially during this time of um, pandemic, there is a lack of awareness of the people with disabilities and the needs they have, like including DSPs, students like myself. And um, I mean, I, I cannot even imagine seeing African Americans with disabilities being oppressed, bullied, discriminated, um, pivoted and um, being um, provoked and targeted. It's just making their lives even more complicated than it, it really is right now. Yeah. Well, Jed, thank you for sharing that. I absolutely agree. The, this pandemic and this political environment has created trauma for so many groups. Uh, we are in a time in which the worst of our uh, humanity has been, I think, exposed and it has had impacts on so many communities, including people with disabilities. Oh, oh uh, yeah, I mean, even for, even for myself, it's been difficult. And I mean, I cannot even imagine, especially the African-American community suffering two pandemics, the yes. coronavirus and also being bullied by white supremacists. Yeah. Yes, uh, agreed. So uh, I appreciate that, Jed. You are always such a great ally in this work. I've heard you express those same sentiments in other forums. And so thank you for acknowledging that for African-American people with disabilities, it's a compounded trauma. And that's something that we're going to be looking at is the intersectionality of identities and how that impacts uh, those who are African-American that have other identities that also are experiencing trauma. So thank you for that excellent yeah, contribution. So I mean, I mean, here, yes, here thank you, Jed. I have, I, sorry, Jed, I see another person with a question. I think Mel has a question, Mel. I'm Mel Pritchard from History and I've been here 16 years. So I'm, I've been through various iterations mm -hmm. of people trying to um, argue that they're for racial justice and mm -hmm. it's like, like it starts and then it just, goes off the rails. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'm really concerned about is, you know, uh, those of you who know me, I'm definitely been doing racial justice stuff. I got the union in here for the faculty. I mean, you know, well, my question is, are you serious about getting black faculty in here? Because I, I, I'm, I'm gonna probably retire in five years and I'm worried that Who's going to be there who replaces me, who can do the things that I do, that is, mentor students, um, you know, look, be the watchdog for racial justice? Mm -hmm. Because um, I, I don't, I'm not so sure about that. If I leave, mm -hmm. when I leave in five years, 2025, mm -hmm. um, who is going to, I mean, uh, what's the process going to be for hiring somebody, making sure that that when I leave, I know that I'm leaving somebody who's going to do the same things that I do, put make sure that that world history class is still there. Yep. It doesn't go by the wayside. Uh, Latin American history doesn't go by the wayside. Um, you know, uh, who's going to uh, who's going to be a watchdog for because um, I, I hear this stuff all the time. 16 years I've been hearing stuff about um, how we're gonna do things better and be more diverse. And, you know, I see a lot of flash and photos and photo ops, but when it comes down to really doing something, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, Mel, thank you for that. And actually I, I agree with everything that you've said, the concern about how we can shift the demographic of our faculty and, 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 and how, can we, how can you be assured that we're actually going to hire more black faculty? Um, and for me, that, that is a critically important question. If, I, uh, if it were within my power to do so unilaterally, I certainly would, but we have a process through which um, you know, we have a collaborative hiring process and that's really a conversation that we need to have with those who are on the screening committees um, who, uh, and with HR. HR doesn't have the control for who applies, but they certainly do have control for outreach. We, can, we are committed to, and part of the plan is to look at the way we are announcing uh, who we're reaching out to, who we're cultivating. Are we creating a diversity? Uh, we have a faculty diversity in internship program. Is that going to 
provide the benefits that we hope that those uh, people of color that we're mentoring right now are going to apply for jobs here and get them. Uh, and Mel, your concern is uh, matched by me. I have the same concern uh, and we are putting that into the plan and I'm actually the lead on that. And I commit to you that we are going to do this work. And my concern is uh, the ways in which we make decisions based on implicit bias, I think shows up in the way we hire and, and we need to get to that. Uh, we need to get to that issue of um, how are we going to start hi hiring people who don't look like us because we are a majority white faculty at this institution at this point. So well, Mel, I, thank you for that contribution. I appreciate it. And I, I agree with your perspective and share your concern. And, and this plan is meant to address uh, that issue intentionally with specific actions attached. And well, I, I, I have wanted... another... Oh yeah. Can Sorry, I just jump ahead. in really quick? And I want to say thank you, Mel, for that level of transparency and honesty, because you ain't the only one who's on here saying, I need to see some stuff. Because this ain't the first time I done heard this stuff. And it looks actually prettier now, but I've seen it all before. And what we have to pay attention to, um, and I want to support Stephanie and the rest of the leadership in this is that, we, you know, yes, we have processes and inherent in those processes are implicit bias, right? And, 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 and things that those processes have gotten us what we got, right? Uh, what, what we have now. And so we've got to look at where are the opportunities for racism to show up and maintain status quo in our processes. We, the myth of meritocracy and all things being fair are a part of what maintains status quo, right? And we've got to look at that more deeply, more critically in order to shift that dynamic, right? And so the commitment, I have no question that our commitment is there to do that. Um, and we have got to be active um, and deliberate and intentional around interrogating the process. Well, and, and I would add to that, Jamie, that I, I give everybody here, I empower everybody here yes. who's on a hiring committee to say, yeah. I don't like this pool, we're gonna extend yeah. and we're gonna go out for more people. I empower you to do that. You do not have to accept the first group of applicants yeah. if you do not feel they are sufficiently diverse and represent the kind of demographic that we are interested in hiring. Right. So I empower you to say, this is not what we are looking for. I am going to extend the search as the, I'm going to ask for an extension of the search. So those of you who have chaired faculty hiring committees, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? And this is where the work needs to be done is to be intentional about thinking if we're trying to diversify our faculty and I'm looking at the demographic of the people who have applied and those who are coming to rising to the top based on the first level interview. Um, I'm just going to be re you know, you may find yourself with all white candidates. I may be reinforcing, I may be reinforcing structural racism by moving these candidates forward. And uh, I, we certainly never hire based on race. We do not, that's not what I'm talking about. We do not hire based on race. We do not. <laughs> Uh, violate the law. But what I'm talking about is the door needs to be open wider and the door needs to be placed in places where people of color exist and live. So if you're opening a door in, in Saratoga, California, but your ideal candidate lives in uh, Piscataway country, then that's not, really, that's not really access and that's not really a, a, a good recruitment. Uh, so Jamie may not even know that the door is open here. So it's not just about opening the door, it's about going to where people are. And yes, great questions about recruitment. We need to examine that. And that's part of this plan is to examine the ways that we uh, recruit and examining who our pools are and thinking intentionally during the hiring process about whether, whether this dem demographic represents who we're trying to hire. All right, I have a question. These are all great questions and great comments. Thank you so much, Mel, for, for um, motivating that conversation. And we certainly have more to say about that. Um, I would like to allow Rebecca Cisneros. She has a question. I have several, but first um, I wanna 
say how pleased I am to see over 100 of my colleagues and friends showing up here today for this conversation. That makes me very happy. Um, I'll try to be brief because we don't want to go too much over time. I know other people, uh, people have other me meetings to attend, including myself. My first is a suggestion um, to you, Stephanie. Um, I'm hoping if you hadn't planned this already that you could plan a part two to this conversation because I know that there um, we need to allot time and attention once we get to read through the plan because it's lengthy and I want time to read through it. Um, and if we won't have a part two, um, who do we speak to about what's in the plan? Do we go to the leads for each section? I mean, I prefer that it be an open forum like it is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's question slash. Well, we can absolutely have a part two. I think that's an excellent suggestion, I think. And, and I, uh, that's what I would like to do that. I think that's uh, obviously we're at 12.05 and we got a lot of people who want to talk about it. So let's do that. I have a regular Friday forum, so we can schedule it as part of the regular Friday forum. Um, and uh, so, yes, we will do that. Great. Okay, because I, I need to break it down more, you know, I want to break down the specifics of it, like what exactly does it mean to um, unearth and account for, you know, our racist history? What does that look like? Does that, mm -hmm. Is there going to be some research and then reporting out? Like, yes. where does that go? Yeah, and uh -huh. we'll talk, we can talk about that in the, in the part two, yeah. Okay, and then um, I know a lot of this is going to call for data right? We need data. So I'm wondering if the college is going to grow our research analyst department because mm -hmm. we constantly need data. Mm -hmm. And it's historically been a one person office. Mm -hmm. And I think that for the work that we're trying to do, what we're trying to understand, we need more than a one person mm -hmm. uh, research analyst office. Mm -hmm. Yes. If we're going in that direction. Yeah, we are. We are building out. We're going to be building out uh, the, the the district. If there's going to be a district structure, uh, and so we're going to be building that out. More to come on that. But yes, that's a good point, and definitely one of my goals. Okay. Well, I have more questions, but I'll save it for the. I'll save them for the part two. Thank you. Please yeah. Do. Exactly. Please do. Yeah. Um, so, family, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to jump off. People are calling me from. The other places I'm supposed to be at noon. <laughs> so uh, I am going to leave for now, but have a wonderful weekend. Can't wait till part two and can't wait to continue to be in this work with you. Thank you all. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you all for being present. Uh, I am so, I feel so blessed to have you as my colleagues and honored really. Thank you for uh, your interest in this work. We're all gonna jump off to other meetings, but thank you. Have a wonderful Friday and we will schedule our part two and let you know. Take care all. <laughs>